everybody a uh, little miscommunication there uh, welcome to Bible study and today is March the 22nd yes, it is. 2014 right yeah. and it is uh, the 19th. 19th day of Adar two. Two, the second or Adar 2 and uh, so that means Passover is on the evening or beginning of the 15th day of Nisan, so it's about three weeks away. Time is rapidly <laughs> flying by. And I do so look forward to Passover this year. Another year in the hatch, as they say. Another year down, and, and uh, who knows how many are left before the Messiah returns. I would say probably not very many. I think we're definitely living in the last days, the end times, the end of days, and the end of this generation, and the coming of the Messiah is right around the corner. And a lot of people are ignorant of that. They don't know that. They don't believe it. And even those who tend to maybe believe it, they're all in confusion over how much time we have left. Some think it's 100 years. Some think it's 50 years. Or... 25 years, well, I think it's going to be a lot sooner than that. I look at the world today and the chaos, the destruction, the trouble, the rising up of persecution and anti-Christian sentiment and feeling around the world. And the world is going to hell in a handbasket, as they used to say. And the devil is rising up, creating strife and persecution. <coughs> in the martyrdom of saints. And we are deceived today. We're blinded. Most people do not understand that Christians are being martyred and beheaded and murdered and crucified today in Syria and Afghanistan, Pakistan, Indonesia, Egypt. But right now the focus point is Syria. And there is a genocide going on in Syria against Christians, just the, like there was a genocide that went on against the Jewish people in Nazi Germany prior to and during World War II and the Hitler regime. And the world is already headed back in that same direction today, and it is... A hidden holocaust, a secret holocaust, and the media is totally silent about it. Even Fox News does not discuss it. The State Department blows it away and denies it because the State Department and the American government is in bed with the Muslim extremists and the Muslim Brotherhood. And they are the architects of this violence today against Christians. In Libya, especially in Egypt, and, and the focus point right now is Syria. And it's growing more and more every day and every month around the world. It's not decreasing, it's increasing. And it's coming to America. It's coming to our shores. It's spreading like a wildfire around the world, and people are blinded. I'll get back to that a little later in the Bible study, but right now I want to cover some other news, which is very relevant to what's going on today in, in the church and uh, the world and prophecy being fulfilled. I thought I would start with an article that came out in yesterday's paper, the Wenatchee Times, by Charles Krauthammer, one of my favorite commentators. And his title is, The Invasion Will Be Catered. Now, Charles Krauthammer is a brilliant man. He, he lives in a wheelchair. He lost the use of his legs years ago in an accident, as I recall hearing. Or reading. 
and he's been wheelchair bound for many years, but he has a sharp, cutting, incisive mind and a great level and depth of understanding what's happening in the world, in politics, and uh, in general. He's a former or a psychiatrist or a psychologist and a, do a doctor, Dr. Charles Krauthammer, but now he's a political commentator and has been for quite a while, since the days of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, I believe, is when he began. He says in his article, early in the Ukrainian crisis, when the Europeans were working on bringing the Ukraine into the European Union system, and Vladimir Putin was countering with threats and bribes. One British analyst lamented and said, we went to a knife fight with a baguette in fighting with Russia over the Ukraine. The Western world went to this fight with a, with a cupcake, a piece of bread, while the Russians came with knives and forcible actions. Well, Charles says that was three months ago. Life overtakes parody. During the Ukrainian Prime Minister's visit to Washington last week, his government urgently requested assistance, military assistance, to fight off or stave off the Russians. The Pentagon refused. Now let's get this straight, brethren. The Pentagon didn't refuse. Barack Hussein Obama refused. He is the dictator of this country. He rules it like a dictator, a tyrant in principle and in fact, although not according to the Constitution, according to the Constitution we don't have a dictator. But in reality the Pentagon does what the President says. <coughs> <coughs> and Obama refused help to the Ukrainians. Charles Kronheimer says the Pentagon instead offered military ration kits, which mean, you know, you know, lunch, rations for, uh, for soldiers. What, what they used to call that? Uh, K rations. K rations. <laughs> yeah. K rations. <coughs> Putin, in the meantime, has mobilized thousands of troops, 80,000 troops, artillery and tanks and attack helicopters on Ukraine's borders. And Washington counters his thrust with cupcakes and cookies, baguettes, American style, K rations. One thing we can say for sure, Krauthammer says, is these, in these uncertain times, these dangerous times, what the Apostle Paul calls perilous times, one thing we can be sure of, that is the invasion of the Ukraine will be catered by the United States. We'll be the waiters of the dance of the Russians through the Ukraine. We'll hold the coats of the people coming to the dance. We'll be bystanders, in other words. We're not invited to the party. We'll cater the party, tongue-in-cheek. Why did we deny Ukraine weapons, Krauthammer asks, because in, <coughs> in the Barack Obama and John Kerry worldview, arming the victim might be taken for a provocation. If we arm the Ukrainians, that might provoke the Russians and Putin. What they don't seem to understand is that our display of weakness and indecision and cowardice and, and our trepidation and fear is broadcast like a spirit to the whole world 
and the whole world is sitting up and taking notice of America's absolute flabby weakness, especially in the Chinese in Asia who have been threatening to seize islands from Japan and islands from the Philippines and to extend their empire without any threat or fear of America. America's power has been decreasing. We are soon going to have an army smaller in size than we had prior to World War II. That goes back to 1940, 1941, the year I was born. American power is shrinking. Obama can say to the world, or his wife, look honey, how I've shrunk America. Because he has other goals and ambitions in mind. Well, Kronheimer says, why did we deny Ukraine weapons? Because in the Barack Obama, John Kerry worldview, arming the victim might be taken as a provocation. This kind of mind-bending, illogic, he says, has marked the administration's response to the whole Crimean affair. I would say we're committing a crime in Crimea. A crime of dilettante response. Cowardice under pressure. Weakness in the breach. Why, Charles says, why after all did Obama delay responding to Putin's infiltration, military occupation, and seizure of Crimea in the first place? In order to provide Putin with a path to de-escalation, they said. We're going to give him an off-ramp, hoping he'll change his mind. So we will not confront him. We'll give him more baguettes and more cupcakes. The off-ramp idea comes from the White House. That's their phrase. An off-ramp, what, what Charles says, did they actually think that Putin was losing? Does he need an excuse to bail out? Mm. Why, he's winning like Hitler won when he took over the Sudeten land in Czechoslovakia prior to World War II. He's winning piecemeal by just moving in, like the Russian bear is historically noted to do, as Winston Churchill said. The Russians are like a bear. They just move in where there's no opposition. But this is, if there's opposition and a locked door, then they'll just go somewhere else where they can get in. They're like a bear. They're not really aggressive. They're pushy. And they'll go right in where they can push their way in. Well, according to Charles Krohammer, America and Obama are, have committed a monumental blunder and their organization, their administration, <coughs> is totally divorced from reality. In fact, John Kerry threw up his hands and said, well, you don't do this in the 21st century. You're going back to the 18th and 19th century, Putin. You're acting belligerent. You're acting aggressive. We don't do that. Today, in this gentlemanly world of the 21st century, that's a no-no. And uh, John Kerry sees the world through rose-colored glasses. And I would say that uh, Barack Obama just lacks the courage of, he's like the boy George who sang the song, I'm a, mean, I'm a man of no conviction. He's a man of no conviction. He has no dog in this race or no pony in this race. We have no real interest in the Ukraine except their 
democracy, their freedom, but no, we're not concerned about that. We're afraid of World War III. We're afraid to stand up. And, you know, the right wing and the left wing in America, both the conservatives and the Democrats both seem to agree on that. Neither one. Even though we're begged by the Ukraine to come to their defense and help them out and send them, not to get involved with troops on the ground, but send them weapons. We won't back them up. So they have no backup, so Putin will just probably roll right in. Take over piecemeal. He's already taken the Crimea. Well, this reminds me personally of the Korean War. My dad fought in the Korean War. He was on board the battleship Missouri, BB-63. He used to call it with 18-inch guns, and they'd pound the coast of Korea, and their shells were so loud when they scream out off the battleship that all the men on the ship had to wear earplugs. And when those shells hit the shores of Korea, They'd make huge, gaping holes about 15, 20 feet, <coughs> 30 feet deep and wide, which was pretty big in those days. Well, you know, the North Koreans invaded South Korea, and they just kept marching down through South Korea. And America had our soldiers there to defend the border, and we kept retreating. I used to see a map in the Norfolk Times, I think it was. I was about 10 years old, 9 years old, 9 or 10. And I used to read the stories <coughs> about the war. And uh, the, they had a map every day in the newspaper showing the American lines retreating southward on the Korean Peninsula and the North Koreans advancing mm -hmm. and just kept advancing and, and finally uh, President Harry S. Truman sent General MacArthur over there to, to fight the war and lead the American forces, Douglas MacArthur. And he got over there and we were just had a line now around the little southern port city of Pusan. And MacArthur launched an amphibious invasion along the western coast of Korea, back all the way up the peninsula, halfway up. He launched an amphibious invasion. And American troops poured onto the mainland and just overwhelmed the North Korean forces up there and got behind their front lines, which are way down in Pusan, and cut their lifeline, their umbilical cord, surrounded them, wiped them out, and marched all the way up through North Korea. We had virtually taken all of North Korea when, oh, well, yeah, Red China entered the war. The Communist Chinese began to pour across the border, which was defined by the Yalu River and the bridges across the Yalu. They poured in by over a million troops. And that pressure from the Chinese forced us to retreat back down to about the middle of the, of the peninsula, north of the capital city of Seoul in South Korea. And that war ended in an armistice. There was no one, no victor, no loser. It was an armistice. In fact, the, China, the North Koreans claim they're still at war with us today because there was no peace treaty. America settled for second best. MacArthur wanted to bomb the bridges across the Yalu River. But the Pentagon and the State Department said, no, that would offend the Chinese. <coughs> They're already fighting in the war. They would not allow our bombers to bomb the bridges. They would not allow us to counterattack. And MacArthur said we should go in there and A-bomb China. <laughs> well, he, it was too bad he voiced his concerns and opened his mouth because Truman then fired him. Hmm. 
took him off to Seine and brought him back home to America, where he was met with rousing crowds and great enthusiasm, but not by President Harry S. Truman. And then the next elections, Dwight D. Eisenhower ran, the former general in World War II, and he became our next president. Well, America is back in the days of prior to World War II and the Neville Chamberlain peace program with Adolf Hitler. He came back with a signed agreement from Munich, Germany, signed by Hitler saying he was going to have peace. He had enough war now. He had taken over the part of Czechoslovakia and the Rhineland, and he was content now. So he signed the peace. And Chamberlain came back waving the paper to England saying, we now will have peace in our time. A few months later, Hitler attacked Poland, bombed Poland, and made an agreement with Russia that they would divide Poland between them. Russia and Germany would divide Poland. Well, that led to World War II. The British finally responded, and the French responded, and the, the Triple Alliance began to fight, the Triple Entente, I think it was, or that might have been World War I, they called it that. But Britain and France and their allies went to war against Germany. And Germany went to war against the West, and later Germany attacked Russia, too, so they entered the war. Then, of course, Red China came into the war in Korea, and America backed down and just drew a line just north of Seoul, Korea, on the peninsula. And as I said some time ago, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and occupied Kuwait in a matter of like a blitzkrieg a few weeks, and the U.S. did not respond. George Bush was president, and he just said, well, let's, you know, we don't approve of that, so we need to get the United Nations to intervene. They finally talked the United Nations into intervening in the Arab states because they were fearful of Saddam Hussein. So we sent troops to Arabia. Saudi Arabia, to draw the line, to push Saddam out of Kuwait. A more stupid policy I could not think of, really. You know, because all we did was finally we pushed them out of Kuwait with a huge carpet bombing campaign in Iraq. So we pushed them out of Kuwait, then we just stayed there and gave Kuwait their freedom, but we did not finish the job and attack Iraq. We left Saddam in power, and he rebuilt his power. He was left on the scene. George Bush was afraid of provoking Russia. Even after the Iron Curtain had fallen because of Ronald Reagan's brilliance and character and authority, Russia backed down, and Russia lost the Cold War. Now they're coming back. After the failures of the Bush administration and the Clinton administration, and now the Obama administration, Russia's back on the scene bigger than ever. Stronger than ever. And now they've invaded Crimea, and they're probably going to chomp down and gulp down the whole Ukraine. Who's going to withstand them? Not Europe. The world is entering a time now of great fear and trepidation. Perilous days, as prophecy says, and history is repeating itself. In the hot news column, I have an article here that says, President Putin of Russia signed the treaty now which adds Crimea to the map of Russia. So according to Putin, Crimea is now part of Russia. 
as the first battle, the opening salvo of the new war, you might call it a cold war, it was cold as long as we don't fight, they just keep taking over step by step. Oh, it's going to come to a fight. You know the book of Revelation shows there's going to be a final time when the West fights back and the West and the East will have a confrontation called the fifth and sixth trumpets of Revelation or the first and second woe of Revelation in the day of the Lord, which is fast approaching. But the real story of the Ukraine is uh, not just a matter of Russia invading the Ukraine. That's just one side of the story. The other side is the politics that have been going on underground and in the West to add the Ukraine to the Western alliance and to add them to the European Union. Although the Ukraine points like a dagger right at the Soviet Union, a dagger in its stomach if you look at a map, the West wants to, Europe wants to take the Ukraine and add it to the European Union, which would greatly weaken Russia and keep them weak. So Russia's really, you might say, they're fi fighting in self-defense now because their only warm water ports are at Sebastopol on the Black Sea uh, off the coast of Ukraine. That's their only access to the Mediterranean from a warm port in Russia. And so they've added the Crimea, which has always been under Russian influence anyway. So what we have, uh, according to this, this other article I have from uh, Personal Liberty, the Ukrainian pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, was recently ousted from his position after he rejected an international monetary fund demand to raise taxes in his country. He rejected the IMF, a Western banking cartel, when they demanded he raise taxes and devalue his currency. So the United States and Europe installed a new leader for the Ukraine, a central banker and hand puppet, Arsenev Yatsenyuk. A Forbes magazine article describes him as the kind of technocrat that you want to have if you want austerity with the veneer of professionalism. He's the type of guy who will hobnob with and go along with the European elite of the West. Well, this of course, Russia consider this to be a direct attack on their man, their puppet, the original Ukrainian government. This was an insidious attack by the West. So they fought back by annexing Crimea so far. And the US and Europe have been con consternated by this. They've been shaking in their boots, their hands trembling because now they've provoked the Russian bear. And they don't want World War III. So they're not really going to do anything except a few sanctions. <coughs> well, in the wee hours of March the 2nd, the U.S. in retaliation took possession of the Ukraine's $1.8 billion of gold reserves as partial payback for the $5 billion that we loaned them dragging Ukraine toward the European Union. This is also gold that the U.S. can pass on to Germany, who's been demanding we return their gold, which we've been holding for them. In Fort Knox, probably. Except other reports say Fort Knox is now empty. And that we've been using German gold to back up our lending money and printing money. It's not even our gold fat chance the Germans are going to get it. So we give this gold we get back from the Ukraine to the Germans
the European Union and everybody's happy for the time being. Now, when we sacked Iraq during the George Bush administration in the war against Saddam Hussein to overthrow that dictator, we also confiscated that country's gold. The U.S. did. Now we've abandoned Iraq to their fate. <coughs> then, of course, the U.S. used NATO to bomb Libya into sub submission and ousted Gaddafi as the president of Libya. We sacked their gold reserves, which was 150 tons of gold estimated. 150 tons. It's a lot of gold. And that gold then disappeared, leaving the country of Libya ruled by gangs and Al Qaeda. <coughs> you see, uh, perhaps a sign of greed and avarice in, in these moves. Why do we really attack Iraq? We got their gold and control of their oil. So we said we stole their gold, and now we're now they have mayhem in Iraq. Then we we led an attack on Libya. Now we've taken their gold. Now we've taken gold back out of the Ukraine, and it's all a fight after gold and money and wealth. And trying to defend the dollar, although we're deep in debt in this country of over 17 trillion dollars, which nobody can imagine how bad that is, the extreme significance of that. Trillions, I mean, who can count to a trillion? It'd take you several lifetimes. And we're 17 trillion dollars in debt. An article I read last week showed that's about 400 thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child in America. Four hundred thousand dollars that you owe just by taking a breath because our country owes it. Well, I think this tells you a little more about the story of what's going on in the Ukraine. It's a, it's a political power play between the East and the West, and it's just it's now the current front lines of the quest for world dominion. The front lines run through the Ukraine today. And Russia has massed its army on the Ukrainian border with 80,000 troops ready to invade. And let's see. As well as 270 tanks, 180 armored vehicles, 380 artillery pieces and 18 multiple launch missile systems and 140 combat helicopters, or rather aircraft, 90 combat helicopters and 19 warships, uh, ocean vessels. They've been amassing their army and their military on the borders of the Ukraine. Certainly that's intimidation, and now they've got the Crimea back under Russian control as a province of Russia. And if they want to, they can just walk in and take the rest of the Ukraine, because we've already shown all we're going to do is give them K-rations. There is no defense for the Ukraine. And it's all building up to World War III. It's just like Hitler marched in the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, and Europe said, okay. Then, and then that finally led to World War II. Because Hitler's appetite only grew. And Putin's appetite is just growing. He's not satisfied yet. Well, I find it interesting because I'm, I've always been very interested in geopolitics. Since I was nine years old and watching the North Koreans invade South Korea and studying that map every day 
as the North Korean lines got deeper and deeper into South Korea, and America sent troops over there to help stave off defeat. And finally we were surrounded on that little tip of the peninsula to the city of Pusan. It looked like curtains. I was furious. I mean, I was only nine years old, but I was furious. Why are we losing, Dad? Why are we losing? We've got the battleship Missouri. We've got the biggest army and navy in the world. We've got the atomic bomb. But we didn't have the courage of our convictions. We didn't have righteous convictions. God says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, The wicked flee when no one's even pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I wrote an op-ed opinion art, art letter to the <coughs> Pasting the Star News and the Los Angeles Times back in 1990. 19, I think it was 90. 19, when, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And George Bush did nothing but blather and just do nothing and just tried to put the United Nations just together and work through the UN because he was seeking to make and build a new world order. And I thought, I wrote a letter and I said, I said, back in the days of Teddy Roosevelt, former American president, we wouldn't tolerate this. We would send in the Marines, as he did, as America did when in Cuba. The Cuban-American War, the Spanish-American War, as he did to the Philippines. He sent Admiral Dewey and his fleet of ships to seize the Philippines. Thomas Jefferson sent the U.S. frigates and Marines into Tripoli during the days of the Barbary Pirates. America used to say, with a rattlesnake on his flag saying, don't tread on me. We used to be bold and courageous, but now we're a nation of cowards. And why is it? Because we're wicked. The wicked flee when no man pursues. They're scared of their shadow. But the righteous have come strong confidence in God Almighty and His help and His shield and His armor so they act bold as a lion. David was bold as a lion. He confronted Goliath. God gave him the victory. But those who don't have righteousness <coughs> don't have fearlessness. The key to bravery and courage is contact with God, knowing God, trusting God, praying to God. Our country it's lost its contact with God. We don't know God anymore in this country. We don't pray to God. We don't have any confidence left. Those who trust in an arm of flesh will be destroyed. But those who trust in the arm of the Almighty will be delivered. Well, I was reading this sent to me by one of our members. This, these are words, wise words, from, from a modern American patriot and movie star, uh, Clint Eastwood. You all saw him during the Republican convention a year and a half ago when he had the empty chair mm -hmm. up on the stage and he kept talking about that empty chair. Yeah. The invisible man was sitting in the empty chair who leads from behind. <coughs> Meaning, of course, Barack Hussein Obama, whose brother is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, whose family are all Muslims in Africa. 
and his brother Malik is a right-hand man of a Muslim terrorist who's on America's watch list, the head of the Sudan, and his brother Malik is works for him as an assistant and has a nonprofit organization approved by the U.S. Tax Internal Revenue Department as tax exempt to raise funds for Muslim charities allied with this terrorist in the Sudan. And he is a wanted man in Egypt. Well, he's the brother of the president. <coughs> Maybe that's why the president is so pro-Muslim. Clint writes and says, <coughs> My twilight years <coughs> never give me fruit to drink before Bible study anymore. It gets into my throat. Fine. Thick fruit juice is not the answer. Okay. So he says uh, in his little piece, My Twilight Years, Clint writes, As I enjoy my twilight years, I am often struck by the inevitability that the party must end. There will be a clear, cold morning when there isn't any more. No more hugs. No more special moments to celebrate together. No more phone calls just to chat. It seems to me, he says, that one of the important things to do before that morning comes is to let everybody know, everyone of your family and your friends, to know that you care for them by finding simple ways to let them know your heartfelt beliefs and the guiding principles of your life so they can always say, he was my friend and I know where he stood. So, Clint says, just in case I'm gone tomorrow, please know this. I voted against that incompetent, lying, flip-flopping, insincere, double-talking, radical socialist, terrorist, excu excusing, bleeding heart, narcissist, scientific and economic, well, anyway, he voted against Obama. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the bottom line of his little diatribe here. That's where he stood. <clears throat> and I'll say this, I voted against him too. <clears throat> I voted against him both times. But I do think that God put him there. God is the one who orchestrates who wins and who loses. He, he puts down kings and raises up kings and prime ministers and politicians. So Obama's there in a sense. He's doing God's work. But you know, the devil does God's work. Did you know that? Satan works for God. He's under God's authority. He can't do anything except what God Almighty allows him to do. God raised up Pharaoh to afflict and oppress the children of Israel in Egypt. For several hundred years they were oppressed. Yet it got worse and worse and worse. Book of Jasher shows what happened there. God raised up Pharaoh and he says so. He said, I have hardened Pharaoh's heart. So he will not let you go, so that I might illustrate my power and my deliverance on your behalf. So I've explained this to Cappy and others in articles in the past. 
That does not mean that God made Pharaoh obstinate and forced him to en enslave the children of Israel. It means he gave them the opportunity to do what he wanted to do in his own heart. He raised them up. He allowed him to have that office of Pharaoh. That Pharaoh fought for it and connived for it and got himself elected, you might say, or appointed by the leading men of Egypt. Just, just like Hitler was elected in Germany by the people become the head of the Third Reich. He was elected in a democracy. The people chose him. Then he led the world into a bloodbath. Well, Pharaoh became the Pharaoh, but he was a man of evil character and a stubborn temperament. So he did what nature told him to do. And God has allowed Obama to rise to the top of the heap in our country today because of the wickedness of the people. They wanted change, and they, he promised change. And now we're getting changes right and left, which people had not anticipated. They thought Obama would come in and solve all their problems. But unemployment has increased. Millions of more people are on food stamps. Our economy is going down the tubes. Our national debt is exploding. And all I can say is with Clint Eastwood, well, I didn't elect that guy. I voted against him. But our people voted him in. And they're going to, they've sown the wind, they're going to reap the whirlwind, as the prophet Hosea says. Okay, now I'll skip over a few things to the next segment of the Bible study I want to cover. Because we need to always keep our eyes focused on the Middle East and Israel and what's happening there. And once again, America is stubbing its toe and stumbling in its foreign policy and creating a mess, creating havoc creating a vacuum of power which is being filled by our enemies and sworn enemies, the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda. And to show how diabolically mixed up our foreign policy is, our country is supporting Al-Qaeda and their affiliates in the civil war raging in Syria. We may not have liked Assad, the president of Syria, but he gave his country stability and he did protect the Christians. And now civil war is raging in Syria and the insurgents are the Al-Qaeda and their affiliates who are running the show and massacring Christians. Assad didn't do that. Al-Qaeda and the militants are doing that with American support. Military support, financial support, weapon shipments from Jordan and Iraq, wherever we can ship them in from. We are making a mess over there. We are creating a disturbance in the force. Well, we're making a mess in the Middle East too by pursuing the so-called pathway to peace in Israel. Recently, the Knesset in Israel hosted the first ever parley to discuss the Temple Mount sovereignty the rulership over the Temple Mount. 
Israel reconquered the Temple Mount in 1967, the Six-Day War. They, re they reoccupied the Temple Mount, the former place where God's house stood. Ben Har Abiyat, the general said, as they stood on the grounds of the Temple Mount. The house of God is in our hands. Once again, after almost 2,000 years, well now, 2014, for the first time ever since 1967, the Jewish ruling body, the Knesset, has hosted a parley on the sovereignty and control of the Temple Mount. The State of Israel is pointless without the Temple Mount, said Minister Moshe uh, Faglin of the Likud Betenu party. At the first plenary discussion of Israeli sovereignty over the holy site, he said, to the other members of the Knesset. Behind the nation's back, Israel's back, we gave up every remnant of Israeli sovereignty on the mount. Today, any terrorist organization can wave its flag there, but the Israeli flag? It's unmentionable. Why is that? Because they had left the Arabs in charge of the Temple Mount, the holiest site in the world, the holiest site to Israel. They did not annex it. They left it under the control of the Arabs. And Moshe finally is finally, after 50 years, beginning to complain. Almost 50 years. 47 years ago, the Jews recaptured the Temple Mount, 1967. That was a marvelous day to me. I remember that day. I was up in San Francisco serving in the ministry of the Worldwide Church of God with Dennis Luker, the overall pastor of that area. I was assisting him and giving sermonettes and Bible studies. And we got the news that the Jews had gone to war with the surrounding Arab states. June 5, 6, 5 through 14, I guess it was. Or 5 through 12. 6 through 12. Anyway, it was a six-day war. And... We got the news, and the Jews recaptured the Temple Mount. And I thought prophecy is being fulfilled. Later I found out it really was. Because Daniel 8 speaks of a 2300 day prophecy. After which the house of God would be restored. The Temple would be restored to Israel. And you count the prophecy Daniel 8 from when the the Greek armies crossed the river Granicus into Persia, the beginning of the Greco-Persian War under Alexander the Great, 336 B.C. was the start of that war. And you count 2,300 years, a day for a year, from then it leads you to 1967, because there's no year zero. When the prophecy said the temple would be restored, we, we uh, given back to Israel, or seized, as it was. And what did Israel do? They turned around and gave its control to the Muslim Jordanian Wafq, a Muslim organization, which was the biggest mistake they ever made. Now Israelis can't even go in the Temple Mount and pray. 
They can't go to the Temple Mount and carry a Bible or a Torah. Nor can Christians. Years ago I led a tour to Israel and we went up on the Temple Mount. And we carried cameras, you know, in our little bags. And I had a, had a Bible in my bag I took up there. S smuggled it up on the Temple Mount. It was contraband. If, I, if they'd caught it, they would have taken it and escorted me off the Temple Mount. But we weren't allowed to have a Bible study or to talk from the Bible. And this was about 1980 when I was there. Well, the article goes on in the Jerusalem Post. Likud Minister Moshe Feinlin and a group of right-wing activists, they called him, were besieged by hundreds of Arab youths incensed by the politicians' visit to the Temple Mount Thursday morning. That forced the police to remove him and his guests from the holy site. Several of the youths in the group threw stones at the group shortly before 8 a.m., resulting in two arrests. No one was injured. When he was researched by, uh, when he was reached by telephone later, Feynman said he coordinated his visit to the Temple Mount in advance with the police department and other officials. It had been approved. Then he accused the Waf Islamic religious body, which oversees the Temple Mount compound, of aiding and abetting the attackers, the rioters. He said the Muslim Waf is paying people to be on the mountain only when Jews go up there to scare them and attack them. I believe, he said, they were waiting specifically for me because he's outspoken that Israel should have the sovereignty over the Temple Mount. And God says so too. I say so too. The servants of God all agree if they really serve God, the Jews own the Temple Mount. It belongs to God. He gave it to the Jews. And God says in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 6, Build my house, says the Lord. But build my sanctuary, my tabernacle. Exodus, Exodus 25 and verse 8. God said to Moses, verse 8, And let them, Israel, make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. There is no sanctuary on the Temple Mount today. God does not dwell among the Jews today, because they have not returned to him in body and mind and spirit. The nation of Israel is a secular nation. They want to be recognized by the other nations in the world as one of them. They don't want to be unique. They don't want to serve God today. And until they do, they're under a curse. Just as America has turned its back on God, now and we're under a curse. And the curses are multiplying. Minister Moshe Feinlin said, The police tolerance of the Muslim rioting on the Temple Mount and their abdication, the government's abdication, a full sovereignty there has led to the problems that are exploding on the Temple Mount and in Israel. 
He said, after the attack, the police sent the Jews out and gave the violent Muslims a prize, which is sad. He said, if there is a reason that the Temple Mount is a powder keg today, it is because even today it has been proven that violence pays. Weakness invites more violence. That's why the Arab youth are rioting on the Temple Mount, because they're allowed to get away with it. Violence is paying because the Israelis are not acting like a lion and taking charge. They're acting like a mouse. They're acting like a mouse, a coward, a craven weakling with no faith in God. Violence, weakness invites more violence, he said. He commended the police for handling their, the situation, but added that removing Jews from the site is, quote, inviting the continuation of violence and escalation, increasing of more violence. You know, they reoccupied the site in 1967. Then they abdicated it to the Muslim control and that is an abomination. That is an abomination of desolation. They need to reoccupy and govern with full sovereignty the territory of the Temple Mount. The frequently violent Arab response to Jewish visitation rites to the Temple Mount has a history dating back to when the Waf was given overnight following the Six-Day War in 1967, the oversight. They were given the oversight after the Six-Day War to, to rule over the Temple Mount at their discretion. And their pleasure. Even though the Jewish Supreme Court has upheld the Jewish prayer rites on the Temple Mount, it makes no difference because the court also allows the police to prevent any form of worship there if they believe that that activity might incite a disturbance. So they just keep the Jews off or won't let them worship there. It might cause a disturbance. The Muslims might just get angry and riot and throw stones and react. And that might cause the Saudi Arabians to get mad and all the other Arab states. Oh, we must be fearful and tremble before the Arabs and the Muslims. They are on the march today, and Christianity is on the retreat. Even the Christianity of the world. Minister Moshe Feinlin, after physically being attacked on the Temple Mount, said, Behind the back of the people, we have given up on any Israeli sovereignty on the Temple Mount. Any terror organization can wave its flag up there. But the flag of Israel? Don't even mention it. A verse of Psalms, he said, is a pretext for, let's see, uh, for being arrested. The police even recommend the Jews take off their kippah, off their head, the symbol of being a Jew, if they go up there. The police recommend that. The incidents today, he says, are showing more and more than ever that the Temple Mount is a powder keg specifically because it is clear to the Palestinians that violence pays off. They get their way. All they have to do is act up 
throw a tantrum like a screaming child, and the world will give them their way. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. You can have that toy. You can have your way. And that is, as I said earlier, that's an abomination. The Temple Mount is the most holy site in the world, where God chose to place his temple in the days of King David and the great holocaust that was occurring in his day because of the plague. And over a hundred, think over a hundred thousand people died in that plague. And the angel of the Lord was hovering over the Temple Mount, the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, with his sword in his hand, probably a comet, or pictured by a comet, a sword-type comet, hanging over Jerusalem at that moment in time, when David cried out to the Lord, and he repented of slaying the Israelites in the plague, and stopped it, and told David to purchase that field of Ornan, and build his, and to bring the Ark of the Covenant there, and that's where he would build his house, that his son Solomon would build his house on the Temple Mount. Well, Times are racing by, and the tribulation is coming, and the end of this age is fast approaching. And the time has come when the Jews really need to think seriously about this, and they are beginning to. Popular opinion in, in Israel is turning toward the fact that, yes, they need access to the Temple Mount, and they need to exercise sovereignty over at least part of it. Some accommodation must be worked out. Prophecy marches on. Now the next segment of the Bible study is the recent news that several items together about Pope Francis. Pope Francis is a man of mystery. I, I would say personally there are two men of mystery in the world today. One is Barack Hussein Obama. He's a man of mystery. Nobody knows where he came from. He doesn't have a legitimate birth certificate, or if he does, it's in seclusion somewhere. There's doubt and debate whether he's even really an American citizen. Some call him the Ill illegitimate president. Not to mention whether he was also an illegitimate baby when he was born, or wherever that allegedly was. He was a man of mystery, but the other man of mystery is Pope Francis. Came out of Argentina. Italian parents. A Jesuit. Involved in the Argentinian Hunter's rule decades ago when they killed their left-wing enemies and anybody who criticized the government by causing them to disappear. Some of them were thrown out of airplanes over the ocean and made to disappear. <clears throat> the others were tortured and their children confiscated and then take, taken over by other people that were in the government to be their children. Pope Francis has a very dubious background himself. But now, the head of the House of Representatives, John Boehner, has invited Pope Francis to address Congress on a U.S. visit. NBC News House Speaker John Boehner from Ohio extended an open invitation to Pope Francis on Thursday to speak before a joint meeting of Congress. 
before, if he were to ever travel to the United States. Boehner is a practicing Catholic. He extended the invitation to address lawmakers of both parties on the first anniversary of Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio's ascension to the papacy, the crown of the papacy, the first anniversary. Now, a fact, this is a fact, no pope has ever addressed a joint meeting of Congress in all of our history. No pope has ever done that. So this will be a first. We're living in a time of firsts. Obama is the first black president. The first Marxist president. And Pope Francis is the first Catholic pope to address Congress in the United States. President Barack Obama is going to meet with the Pope for the first time soon, for whom the President has publicly professed his admiration. This will occur at the Vatican later this month, the month of March. So I, I see here that the uh, leader of the America, the free world, which is President Obama, which is in the Bible, he may well be the one called the beast, or become that figure. And now he's going to meet with the Pope and he openly admires the Pope. They both seek income redistribution. They both claim to be for the poor. Obama gives them food stamps because he can't give them jobs. The Pope wants the rich to take care of the poor as well. So they're both Marxist in their th theology, you might say. So the question is, an article I have here says, is the Pope laying the groundwork for a one world religion? Ah, look at that. Christians and Muslims coming together in a one-world religion? <clears throat> Who to thunk it? Is that what he's doing? Well, of course he is. He's reaching out to the Muslims. And Obama is reaching out to the Pope. And his whole family's Muslim. He wears a Muslim ring on his wedding finger. This that says, uh, Inshallah Allah, whatever it says. Aluha Akbar. Allah is great, or something like that. The article says, does Pope Francis intend to help the global elite achieve their goal of uniting all religions on the earth under a single banner? Will he be instrumental in establishing a single global religion for the new age? that the global elite are striving to bring about the New World Order. After he was elected, the, the cover of Time magazine declared Pope Francis to be, quote, the New World Pope. Since he was elected, Pope Francis has made it abundantly clear that he is going to make ecumenical outreach a top priority. He is, he is determined to continue on the path of church dialogue and church unity. He's already held a number of very high profile ecumenical meetings. He's reaching out to leaders of various Christian traditions, including Charismatic, Pentecostal, Church of England, as well as other religions. He stresses the mutual bonds that Catholics have with all other religions. Why? Because they're all religious? They worship Shinto and Shiva 
and uh, Buddha and all the different gods are all the same. Is all of the same God as the Christian God? According to the Pope, they all worship the same God. I'll tell you something. They don't worship the true God of heaven and earth. They don't worship Yahweh. He is not Allah. Allah is not him. How do you know Yahweh? They're reading the Bible. It's the word of God. It announces him. It sets forth his name and his Commandments, his attributes, his identity. You compare that God of the Bible with the God of Allah, the moon God of the Saudi Arabians and Muhammad, they don't teach the same thing. They're totally opposite. I'm not going to go into all that, but God commands us to keep the Holy Sabbath, which is Saturday from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. Allah says, worship on Friday. God says, love your enemies. Allah says, kill your enemies or convert them. Give them a choice. Conversion or beheading. God says, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. They're not the same God. They're totally different. And you really study into it all is another name for the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, Satan the devil. He is worshipped as a God, but they don't know who they worship. As Christ said to the woman in John chapter 4 of the New Testament, John 4, this was a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans today would be the Muslims. In John chapter 4, he met her at a well in Sychar. And he was sitting down at noontime, and it was hot, and he was thirsty. John 4, verse 7, the woman of Samaria came to the give, draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the woman of Samaria said to him, Well, how is it that you, being a Jew, would talk to me and ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans. And Yeshua answered and said, I, If you knew the truth, the gift of God, and who it is who is speaking to you and saying, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. Mm -hmm. And the woman said, What, sir? Well, you don't have anything to draw water with. It's a deep well. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it himself? Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water from this well will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I shall give will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give will become in him a fountain of water, springing up for everlasting life, an everlasting fountain. And the woman said, I said, well, sir, yeah, I'd like that water. Give me that water. Give me some. So I don't have to come here and keep drawing water all the time. Uh -huh. And Yeshua said to her, Well, go call your husband and come here. Come back. And the woman said, Well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her, Well, you've well said you don't have any husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now live with is not your husband. Huh. In that you spoke truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I, I perceive you must be a prophet. And how would you know I've got five husbands? How would you know? You must be a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is the right place to worship. The Muslims say 
that the Mecca, Mecca is the place to worship, and that the the uh, black obelisk there in Mecca, the God's word says Jerusalem is the site of the holy temple. There's a parallel here, parallelism. And Yeshua said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You worship in ignorance. The God you worship, you don't even know. We know what we worship, we Jews, for salvation is of the Jews, of the Jewish faith, of the Torah, of the Bible, the book of the oracles of God held and preserved by the Jews and the Christians. And he went on to say, verse 23, but the hour is coming, and now has come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking that kind of person to worship him. Those who will worship him by all their spirit and energy and might and according to the truth, who will love the truth and seek the truth and not be satisfied with ignorance who will persevere and keep studying until they know the truth, and then the truth will make them free. As I said last week, the truth is not exorbitant. We are to hunger and thirst after righteousness and the truth. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. We're going to faithfully dig deeply into his word and mine that golden ore of truth. It's not exorbitant. It doesn't take too much time to study. All it takes is an open heart, a willing mind, a little diligence and perseverance, and a great deal of prayer for God's mercy that he'll open our minds and our hearts because as Christ said, this people's heart is waxed gross. And their hearts are departed from God. They're not seeking God anymore. They're seeking worldly pleasures, money, greed, things. And the only thing that counts is the truth. Verse 24, he says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And that's what we need to do. Truth is the word of God. Allah is a false God. He is Satan in disguise. Satan in drag. The Pope wants to reconcile and reunite the religions of the earth, God is going to come back and do away with the religions of the earth. Christ is going to come and install the one religion, one faith. It says in Zechariah chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 1, Behold, the day is coming, the day of the Lord is coming, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem, he says. Verse 3, and then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as he fights in the day of battle. And in that very day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. What day? The very day he comes back. The very day he descends from heaven. And the trumpet of the archangel blows, and the voice of the archangel cries out with a roar. And Christ returns in glory, in great glory, and the saints rise up to meet him in the air. And the dead saints come out of their graves and rise up to meet him in the air. That is the rapture. That is at the glorious second coming of Christ. That is not some secret clandestine thing that occurs 
years before the glorious coming of Christ, they are one and the same event at the same time. You can read that by comparing 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17. And Matthew 24, verses 30 through 32. Give or take a verse. <laughs> so here in Zechariah 14 again, verse 5, latter part, it says, Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. And they will meet him in the air, and then return to this earth with him, when he stands on the Mount of Olives. Verse 8, and in that day it shall be that living waters will flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, the Red Sea, and half of them toward the western sea, the Mediterranean Sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. And, verse 9, the Lord Yahweh, the one true God, shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, and the Lord is one, and his name is one. One Lord, one name. Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God who reveals himself to the Jews, who calls Jacob his servant, the God who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, and said, This is my name. This I will be known to all generations. Exodus chapter 4. Or chapter 3 of Exodus. Then Moses said to God, verse 13, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, Well, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am Yahweh, the eternal living God. He is and was and always shall be has sent me to you. That is the Tetragrammaton, the Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey in Hebrew. Yahweh. Some pronounce it Yehovah. The earliest pronunciation I have read is Yahweh. And he says in verse 15, This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. My name is not Shiva or Shintu or Brahma or Allah, but Yahweh, the God of Israel. And brethren, Christ is coming soon. And those who are his servants and saints will meet him in the air. And we will forever be with the Lord. Prophecies moving on rapidly. The Pope and the false, the, prop, the false prophets rising up. The beast is rising up. It appears they may be getting together this year to start a relationship, a fandango, if you please, a waltz, a dance, as together they unite the world to fight against Christ when he comes. Keep your eyes open and keep praying. Thy kingdom come. Even so come, Lord Yeshua. Amen. Amen.